Well, welcome. I'm Doug with an opportunity to catch up with Stella Parton. And I want to make sure I get this right because it's a long list of accomplishments here. Singer, songwriter, producer, author, actress, three cookbooks, inspirational memoir, tours with musicals, assisting your sister Dolly in TV movies, BBC's Celebrity Master Chef series, just released 40th studio album, advocate for victims of assault and domestic violence. And we're here to talk about one film in a myriad of films that you've been involved with called Nothing Is Impossible. Stella Parton, welcome. Thank you so much for making time. Hi, Doug. It's good to see you. Good to see you as well. Wow. You don't let the grass grow, right? You've been busy. <laughs> I try to stay busy. You know, you got to stay busy to stay out of trouble. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Well, <laughs> I had a chance to see the movie Nothing Is Impossible that we're talking about streaming on Pure Flix. Um, basically the story of David A.R. White playing the character of a gentleman who was a high school basketball star and did not make it to the NBA, winds up as the school janitor, and then has an opportunity to get back into professional basketball. Um, I noticed it was filmed in Knoxville. What was it about the script, the film, and all those connections that brought you in? Well, uh, they contacted me last summer about being in it, and I thought, well, why not? You know, I haven't been working a lot after quarantine, so I thought, well, I can do this. And since it was a faith-based film, I thought, well, you know, this will probably be a good message. And after reading the script, I could relate to my character of Ruby and somebody who is a supporter of other people's dreams and hopes and plans. And it was about redemption. It was about having second chances. And my character was just a cheerleader, basically, for uh, these two kids that had been in love and lost their opportunity to be together. And then they get this new opportunity. And I thought it was, you know, why not? Um, everything works out and happily ever after isn't that what we all want <laughs> exactly what went involved what was what was involved in the preparation um for the role were there some things that you did to get ready for it or was this character kind of the sweet spot of uh, sweet spot of who you genuinely are well it's not the sweet spot i think that's really who i am <laughs> it's not just a little piece of me i think i try to be more of that type of person than any other kind of person i try to be a person that uh, has empathy for others and can uh, also uh, have compassion when i see people who are needing a little uh, encouragement. And I think that's what uh, having faith is all about, is walking your faith out, allowing yourself to be uh, your own testimony. And uh, as a Christian, uh, a lifelong uh, person of faith myself, um, anytime I can uplift a positive message, I take that opportunity. That's awesome. That's awesome. Do you see yourself doing some more things uh, with Pure Flix or other faith films coming up? I would love to. I think they're a great organization and um, they've asked me about doing some more things and I, I will certainly uh, take it into consideration. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, in a, in a side note for the day that we're recording this interview, we were hit with some sad news in the country music arena uh, with the passing of uh, Loretta Lynn. And I know that you guys uh, were connected. So we know our thoughts and prayers are with the families as they uh, as they deal with loss. It's never easy. It's never easy, and it's never easy to lose a friend and uh, someone that you have shared, uh, you know, part of your life journey with. And the things that I will always cherish about my friendship with Loretta is that she could always be a little girl. And uh, I've always felt like that uh, that's kind of how I was raised. My mother and her three sisters were always little girls, little mountain angels, I called them. And I think that's how we are. And that's how Loretta always was to me. And we laughed a lot and we could complain and gossip and, and talk about our journey. And um, so I'll miss her, but I cherish the memories I have with her. When you talk about family, if I'm reading correctly, you're the sixth of 12 children? I am. Uh, 11 of us grew up together. We had a brother that passed away when he was a baby. Uh, and so I'm the, old, uh, I'm the baby of the first six. And I'm the 
oldest of the last five. Uh, so I got to be their boss and their caretaker, but I got to be the baby of the first six. So, so I, I feel like I was in a really good uh, spot in a family of s so many kids and it worked out for me just fine. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that was something as an, as an only child, I'm always fascinated when I talk with people that had a lot of siblings to grow up with. In one sense, I always wish I had somebody to play with when I was a kiddo as an only child, but maybe there was too much going on in your world. And maybe sometimes you just wanted some space. Well, you know, my son is an only child. My daughter-in-law is an only child and I have one grandchild and Actually, I think in some ways there's the downside to that. You don't have people uh, to have your back always, but by the other, uh, by the same token, you don't have to share a lot of your personal things with them and they can't steal your toys and tear it up. And, you know, I had <laughs> one little brother that was a little older than me and he would take my things and break them apart and see how they work because he liked to see how things work and he ended up being that kind of a person in his career he could make anything work but he tore up a lot of my toys to do that <laughs> <laughs> so i don't think you missed out on a whole lot so just okay. kind of enjoy the space you take up in the world and let the rest of us alone okay <laughs> Well, certainly food has been a part of your journey with three cookbooks. What was this appearance like on the BBC show with MasterChef? Oh, it was a nightmare. I was so traumatized. I, I was telling somebody earlier today, I'll never do another cooking competition. I love to cook. It's one of my love languages. I love to have people over and to love people that way because they can't always hold them on my lap and uh, uh, let them sit there and let me, you know, pet them, but I can cook for them, but I'll never go on another cooking competition because I like to be creative in the kitchen and I don't like to be told what to do when I'm in the kitchen. It's therapy to me. So thank you. No more uh, cooking competitions. One, one, that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> Well, let's shift to a little bit of music here. Recently releasing your 40th studio album, Survivor. Can you share some of the, the themes and inspirations on the songs there? Uh, no, you know, I, I wrote a song for the, the film, but I, I was so uh, slow getting it to them that they ended up, I think they've got a good soundtrack and they didn't need my help at all. Well, I was, and, and we may have lost that on, I noticed we had a unstable thing there we'll edit that part of it out um would you like to share any of the themes within your your latest record um survivor uh well you know i have uh, there's one you were talking about my family and one that i like that i wrote called um last rose of summer and it's kind of a song about my parents and i think of their love story and i uh, really came up with the title for the song the day of my mother's funeral and and then later i wrote the song about them and it's make-believe but it's my idea of what you know that my dad came to get her uh when we you know put her back to the lord and so he walked her through i think so that's what that song's about Beautiful album is called uh, Survivor. I also see that you're an advocate for um, for victims, domestic violence. Um, talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, it's still a huge problem. They've, um, you know, in politics recently, um, they have tried to uh, pass some bills that will protect women and children. I've worked with um, in domestic violence uh, uh, situations for decades now, uh, having been a victim of domestic violence at one time in my life and knowing the devastation of that and how children and mothers who are experiencing uh, abuse in their home. You're living with a terrorist in your own home. So who who needs that? No one deserves that. No child should ever have to uh, flee their home with their mother who's being abused. Um, and Christians don't talk about it enough. I know we're on Salem Network, I think. And I think the churches should talk more about it. But as a matter of fact, you know this and I know this, a lot of 
abuse goes on in Christian homes, they don't talk about it. And you might cut this out, but I'm telling you, it does. A lot of these preachers that need to get up and be talking about that instead of politics in the church today. Hey, I'm just I'm, saying. I'm with you a thousand percent. You can uh, say uh, amen if you want to. <laughs> no, I'm with you there. I'm with you there. Um, my my wife, uh, second marriage for both of us, and she experienced a lot of that in her first marriage. Um, actually wrote a book and shared a bit of her testimony in that. So I'm I, I agree a thousand percent. I don't understand as a man the mindset of her first husband or other men that may be abusive. It's just so foreign to me. But sadly, it's something that happens, and we need to shine a light on that darkness. It's atrocious. Yes, it, it doesn't just happen to people that uh, are in the secular world. It happens in, this, in the Christian world as much as it does anywhere else, but it's never addressed as it should be. I would know I grew up in the church, so I feel like I'm an authority on talking about it, and I'm going to continue to talk about it, and I'm going to be bold about it because I have the boldness of a Christian, and if you're going to be bold, then speak about have righteous anger you know there's it's okay to have righteous anger and i am very angry about how the church keeps sweeping it under the pews and don't talk about it nearly enough you started me on this conversation i wish you hadn't asked this question because we should be talking about the movie but yes this is something i feel very passionate about and i work uh, really hard on this well, I cheer you on in that, and uh, I know a lot of other people do, so thank you for that, and as many people as possible shining the light. Um, Nothing is Impossible is the movie, Pure Flix and the Connection, and your uh, character of Ruby. Um, filming in Knoxville, uh, that's fun, right? At, I'm, I'm here in Nashville. so It was a lot of fun. I loved being at home, being able to, to go uh, back home and do some work, and then hang out, you know, in my on my stomping ground, as they say. Uh, and thank you, uh, Doug, for having me on and talking about the film because it's a happily ever after uh, film. It turns out perfect for everyone, and I like those kind of films. But you know, I'm kind of a hopeless romantic anyway. <laughs> Well, what would you hope would be a conversation that someone would have uh, after they've watched the film? What What do you think that they're that that they're talking about? Well, I would like for people to, after they see the film, to think of it as a hopeful piece. You know that you can have hope. You know because uh, we all are looking for hope every day, and I like to think of my work. Uh, as I'm a, ma a messenger of hope. And so anytime I can be involved in something this uh, positive and this spiritual, then I'm going to do it. And I think people will walk away saying, you know, there was a sweet little story and it's a story of triumph over adversity and, and forgiveness. And let's all try to be more like that if we can. Amen. Amen.